Hi, I'm Ellie Pinzeroni, and today I'm going to be talking about why we should compare works of art. Why should we compare works of art? It seems a bit awkward considering how often we're told not to compare ourselves to others, and that comparison is the thief of joy. In an art history context, however, comparisons become windows for viewing art in new ways. Why? Well, if you're looking for someone to blame, the person would probably be Henrik Wolflin, a 19th century art historian and the inventor of what is the modern day side-by-side -side slide comparison system. He used what he called a magic lantern to expose similarities and differences between works of art. I guarantee if you take any art history class at all, this process will be the basis for most of your papers, your tests, and your in-class processes. So I've broken down the comparison writing process into five easy steps. I'm going to walk you through this process using two amazing images courtesy of the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. All right, you're seated in your desk, you're about to take your art history test, and your instructor directs your attention to the screen and asks you to write a comparison between the two images projected, Vermeer's A Lady Writing and Mary Cassatt's The Letter. What do you do? The first step is really common sense and basic. It's just allowing yourself three minutes to think about what you're seeing and to brainstorm your ideas into a mini brainstorm chart. This might seem simple, but a lot of students just start writing the paper immediately without planning what they're going to say and just allowing, oh, oh, I see yellow and I guess I'll talk about that. This leads to runaway train brain writing. It's very difficult to follow. It's super unorganized. You're not going to be able to get an A-plus comparison if you don't plan ahead. So what I used to do as a student is just to flip my paper over or use the top corner of the instruction sheet and make this little chart. And sometimes I'd even sketch the little copies of the work so that I could see the shapes more clearly. But as you can see in this chart I've made, all kinds of similarities and differences emerge, including the fact that these are both mundane scenes, they're domestic interiors, they're solitary female figures that are writing. So it's a great way of organizing your thoughts ahead of writing. The other vital thing to really be aware of is which painting chronologically came first. It's always important to start with the earliest or oldest work of art so that you don't end up making an inaccurate or false statement about the evolution of style or influence. For example, Mary Cassatt could not have influenced Vermeer unless she time traveled, so you don't want to make that mistake. Step two is to write your introduction. This is why it's so important to already have had your aha moment in terms of what you think is being revealed in this comparison or what your teacher wants you to see through this comparison. Your introduction can be very simple and basic. Usually starts with the earlier work, the work on the left, and the work on the right, the later work seem entirely dissimilar works of art at first glance, but upon closer inspection, many congruencies are revealed. Step three is writing your visual analysis of the first and oldest work of art. So this is quite simple. Just look back at your brainstorming chart with all of your initial thoughts about the work and just flush that out into complete sentences. Step four is your visual analysis of the second work of art. It's important to remember to have a bridge between your discussion of the first work and now moving to the second work. So here I've said, Cassatt's The Letter is an abstracted representation of another mundane moment created over 200 years later. Then I go on to talk about the differences, the similarities, and this is really what you're doing in step four. The final step is writing your powerful conclusion. A lot of students really lose their energy and lose their momentum at the conclusion. It's as though they're so tired from writing the paper that they just copy and paste whatever they had for their introduction back into their conclusion. You can do so much better than that. You want to end with a pow, an aha moment that you haven't talked about yet. Make your conclusion the strongest part of your paper. Okay, hope you guys found that helpful. Have a great rest of your day.